All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start introductions now that it's noon, uh, but I assume we'll be having some people trickle through. Um, and I'm admitting people from the waiting room as they come in. So if I um, paused, I might be doing that. Um, but I'm Shannon Shivers. I am the Director of Education for Oregon Women in Higher Education. And um, I'm really excited to present you with the webinar that we have today. Um, a lot, I saw it in person and it was amazing. So um, you're gonna learn some, some awesome stuff and do some good reflecting. Um, and before we jump right into that, I did wanna plug um, next week on Thursday over the lunch hour um, will be a book club discussion of In Cold Blood um, by Truman Capote. So if you would like to get involved with that, check the newsletters that went out earlier this week um, and there's a link for that. Um, and then we'll be having a great webinar next month as well and you'll start getting more information about that soon. Um, but now that you're all up to date on that stuff, I'm going to go ahead and introduce the, the fabulous webinar you're seeing today. And that is called Job Crafting, Reimagining Your Work to Improve Satisfaction and Engagement. And Alex Algetz from OSU will be uh, moderating that for us. So welcome, Alex. Hello, everyone. It's great to see you all here on the webinar. And uh, thank you for spending your lunch hour with us. I'm really excited about this topic and enjoyed presenting about it at OWHE. And I hope you will enjoy it as well. If you missed the session during our conference, weren't able to attend the conference, or have just learned about OWHE or just learned about this webinar and are joining us for the first time today. And so we're going to go through kind of what is job crafting and discuss that. We will hear from some panelists. I'm joined uh, by two panelists today and have a third uh, story to share with you as well. Then we will talk about how, what job crafting looks like in practice and go into finally an activity that you can do to start applying this in, in your own life, in your own career. So as Shannon said, my name is Alex Algetz. I'm the University Innovation Alliance Fellow at Oregon State University, which is a fancy job title for pretty much being a student success related project manager. And I'm joined today by two panelists. I have Sarah Johnston, who's here from Portland State University, and she is the Organizational Development and Strategy Manager with Human Resources, as well as Chrysanthemum Hayes from Oregon State University, who is the Assistant Director, uh, or Associate Director, we'll let her clarify that one, uh, in Institutional Analytics and Reporting at Oregon State. And we have a third panelist who is unfortunately under the weather and unable to join us today, and that is Sarah Kooten. And she is the uh, University of Oregon, Portland, and she's a director of student services. But thankfully, she was able to share a story with me that I will read uh, from her perspective. So we'll still have her perspective uh, with us as well. So kind of going into what is job crafting? Why should you care about this? Why, why are all of us here today? And so where this came from myself last summer I was feeling really stagnant in my job I'd been doing the same role for about three years and it just things that used to excite me about the job were not feeling as exciting anymore I get a new project and sometimes uh, I was like oh another project whereas a couple years before I would have said great another project and so I saw many of my colleagues that I had started with in that role that were in similar roles to me had were moving on to meet new opportunities and I started thinking did, did I need a new job too? Had I outgrown this role? Why wasn't I so excited and engaged about my job anymore? And so around this time, one of my favorite podcasts, NPR's Hidden Brain, I don't know if you've heard of that one, but one of my favorites, definitely recommend. They featured an interview with psychologist Amy Resnuski about job crafting and about her research and how you could essentially turn the job you have into the job you wish you had. And that really appealed to me as I was thinking that is exactly what I need right now. I don't really want to switch jobs yet. I feel like there's still more I can learn here, but I'm not feeling very engaged and how can I change that? And as I chatted with uh, other women that attend OWHE, I realized this was a, a common challenge and something that others would probably enjoy hearing about as well. So I, I found uh, some panelists who had done this job crafting and went in and, and started exploring it and learning from their stories. So what is job crafting? I've used that term several times. It's in the introduction and name of our webinar today. Job crafting is how an employee can reframe their work 
socially, cognitively, and physically. And it's what employees can do to redesign their own jobs in a way that helps them be more engaged and have higher job satisfaction, be more resilient, and overall thrive to a greater degree. And so we know that roles in an organization have a job description. We all have position descriptions, but there's a lot more to that. Um, the job description is a set list of tasks, but it's up to you how you do those tasks and what order who you engage to to get some of those things done. So employees, even if you don't think you do, have a lot of leeway in the way you think about your job, the way you do it, and who, who you work with at times, and what that job means to you and what it looks like. So that's the space we're going to be diving into today. So thinking uh, here, um, reframing your work is key to job crafting. And so if you reframe your work around these three things, your strengths, your motives, and your passions, that is how job crafting can help you bring your job, your current job, not a new one, uh, into better alignment with your values so you can find greater enjoyment in your role. And what's really helped me kind of put this abstract concept into practice is the three different types of job crafting that in the research literature they've identified. And so we'll talk through what, what those are, and I think you'll see a lot of connections uh, here soon. So first is task crafting. And so with task crafting, you change the boundaries of your job by taking on more or fewer tasks or expanding or diminishing the scope or extent of those tasks. And you can also change how those tasks are performed. So an example in higher ed of this might be an academic advisor who enjoys event planning. And so they take on a larger role, a task, uh, in coordinating their college's new student orientation. Allows them to gain some new skills, get some variety, maybe develop in a, in a certain area that they weren't feeling was part of their role before. The next one in relationship crafting, you change the nature or the extent of your interactions with other people and groups. Example here for higher ed might be a engineering professor who's since moved into administration and really misses their connection with students and with teaching. And so they might serve as a mentor for undergraduate engineering students in order to regain uh, some of that relationship and connection to the work. So you can see there how they are connecting with different people in their role to, to job craft. And then lastly, in perception crafting, this is the one I find really interesting. In perception crafting, you change the uh, purpose of certain aspects or how you think about the purpose of certain aspects of your job. And so you can also reframe your job as a whole. So the idea being here is even if you don't change what you do, you don't change who you interact with, you can still change how you think about that job and what it means to you and the, the reasons why you're doing that job. So the uh, example of perceptions crafting might be a program coordinator who's motivated by helping students succeed, but they re have to do budget reports. And they reframe this least favorite task of compiling budget reports to uh, thinking more about how the program can be sustainable over time and ensuring that so that more students can succeed because the program's able to continue because it's sustainably funded. And so if that last example sounds a little specific, that's one that I've been able to implement in job crafting over the last year. Budget reports are not my favorite. Sorry to any uh, higher ed accountants who might be with us, but uh, that's something that I was able to change my perception around how I was thinking about that task that's part of my job in order to bring it more in line with my values. And it's helped a lot. And so through this example, uh, you can see how stories are a great way to learn about how to job craft. And in that vein, I wanted to pass this over to our panelists who are going to each share uh, one or more stories about how they've job crafted in their current role. So Sarah, would you like to get us started? Great. Yes. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Sarah Johnston, and thank you so much, Alex, for putting this together. Uh, when Alex first introduced this idea of job crafting, uh, I hadn't really heard that term before, but I was excited because I realized that I had been doing that for a long time. So it was nice to put some language around it and kind of a framework uh, to what I, I felt like I've, I've been doing for a little while. So um, I've worked at PSU, Portland State, uh, for about 15 years, and uh, first I was in the Transportation and Parking Department for about nine years, and now I'm in the Human Resources Department, and I've been here for about the last six years. As Alex mentioned, I'm the Organizational Development and Strategy Manager, so 
basically what that means is that I oversee training, uh, leadership development, employee engagement, as well as some process improvement projects. Um, so that's my current role. And um, I think the couple of things that I want to, a few things I want to share about job crafting is first, I've kept in mind two sort of mantras in, in the back of my mind over the past several years uh, with this idea of job crafting and, and figuring out how to how to um, craft my craft my work so that I stay engaged. So the first one is I, I constantly think about how can I help PSU or my department reach its goals. So this I feel like lets me concentrate not only on on how I fit into the higher higher level goals and the longer picture uh, or longer longer term vision, um, but it gets me out of all that day to day you know operational. Um, work and making sure that I'm not just putting out fires and doing the short term things, but I'm still have my eye on that horizon of, of figuring out how can I fit into that long term vision. So that's the first one. The second one is I, I often ask myself, how can I make my job work for me. So we know that we have a position description. We have certain tasks that we have to do. Um, some of those we might like some of those we might we might not like. But I think there's ways uh, that I've been able to focus on professional development that is within that position, but also uh, that really works works for me and make sure that I'm interested in, in the way that I'm developing and the things that I'm that I'm working on. So um, I think those are the two things that I've really kept in mind over the last several years. And I want to share two examples of how I've crafted my job. So the first is uh, I often get the question how did you go from transportation parking to human resources? They seem very, very different. Um, and so here, here it is. So when I was in transportation and parking, um, I had been there for, for several years and I was, I was looking for a change. Um, similar to probably many of you and, and many people, you work in a job and uh, you just, you're kind of looking for, looking for something new um, in transportation and parking. I was, I was a little burnt out on hearing parking stories and parking citation stories. So I was looking for something different and I knew that I really liked the people aspect of my job. Uh, I, was a, I was a manager. Uh, I also managed operations and budgets, but I really liked um, managing and coaching people. And so I thought, well, well, maybe human resources would be interesting. I wonder what that would be like. And so I started planting seeds with um, my boss at the time. And also I, I got a meeting with the head of HR and I just, you know, I let her know, I'm, I may be interested in this, but I'm not quite sure what it would mean to work in HR. You know, I'm not really sure what that would entail. Uh, so I started just talking about it, talking about that I might be interested in changing or at least learning more about what, um, what that move could look like. So, um, once I once I had a couple of those conversations, I realized how little I actually knew about HR, uh, and so then then I had to move into figuring out um, one what were the transferable skills that I had. So what are those current things that I that was doing um, that might be similar to HR, um, and then what did I kind of what did I need to learn? What were those what were those gaps? So. The transferable skills that I focused on were I had a lot of a lot of experience in conflict management, um, a lot of experience with having very heated emotional conversations with people kind of in a service environment. Uh, I also had experience managing people. Um, I also I, I gave a lot of presentations. I also had a lot of relationships across campus um, because of my role in, in transportation. I worked with a lot of different departments. And so um, that was that was also pretty key. So I felt like those would all actually transfer pretty well to human resources. And then the areas that I really needed to learn and, and figure out more about was really the employment law and human resources from sort of the other, the other side, I guess. You know, I knew some of that from being a manager, but I didn't know what that meant sort of from, from an internal perspective. And so those were some of the things that I needed to, to learn pretty quickly. Um, but I, I guess with some some patience and some a few more conversations and some really good timing, I think uh, a position was created and and I moved into HR. So that that's kind of my first example of what I did to try to actually move into a different position. And then um, kind of the second example was once I got into HR, uh, my position was half employee relations and half training. So employee relations is really the those are the folks who help employees and managers kind of through, um, it might be through difficult conversations, it might be through performance issues. Um, employee, employee relations often 
uh, does a lot of coaching with managers, a lot of working through, um, again, tough conversations, performance issues, sometimes terminations, uh, discipline, things like that. And so it was a lot of, again, a lot of transferable skills from some of the, the what I just talked about in transportation and parking. But I quickly realized that a lot of it was reactionary work. Uh, a manager you know, would have a problem and they would call and they would kind of need an answer in the moment. But there wasn't a lot of proactive um, initiatives to get some of that information to managers you know, before they needed help with it or, or before they were in, in a termination meeting or in a disciplinary meeting. And so that's, that's really what I was interested in is working on more of the proactive side. And so that's, that's then where I started to focus is working on building our training. Um, I started looking at our website to try to, you know, be clearer about some information to provide through the website. Uh, I also started information or I started getting involved in projects related to some process improvement that was, again, a more proactive approach to, to getting information out to campus. Um, and a lot of that was, you know, it wasn't specifically in my job description, um, but it was enough, you know, it was related enough where I didn't feel like it was a big leap. And I just started to volunteer to be on work groups or committees that I, I was interested in, not because I had a lot of extra time, but because I knew that if I was, if I was going to have my job work for me and move, move some of those things forward, I needed to leap into those and then figure out how to do it later. Uh, which has often been my approach is say yes and then you figure out how to do it. So um, so after a couple of years kind of with that split role of employee, uh, employee relations and training, I, I really pretty much moved completely away from employee relations um, into the position that I'm in now. Uh, and so I don't do employee relations anymore. I'm really, like I mentioned in the beginning, focused on training, leadership development, um, I've started more employee engagement initiatives and still involved in some process improvement initiatives. So I've really moved into more of the proactive um, work completely. Um, I don't have many, many day-to-day -day fires. Not, there's not many training emergencies. So uh, I've, I feel like I've, I've successfully made that transition into the, the space that I'm interested in. So um, those, are my, those are my two stories. Um, and then I did want to briefly mentioned so sort of one of the other elements that Alex mentioned was relationships in, in job crafting. And I think that has been very key with both of those examples. Um, you know, I, I mentioned that I've built a lot of relationships across campus in the last 15 years. And, you know, both of these examples of me moving into a new position, uh, a new department, and then kind of shifting my position it's, it was in part because people trusted my work, they knew my work, they, they had confidence in, in what I was able to do. And that's because I've, you know, I worked to, to build that confidence. And um, so I can't underestimate, um, I, I haven't underestimated that. I, I think continuing to build those relationships has been a priority. Uh, one of the things that I've done to do that is, for example, I, I gave up my private office, which was lovely, um, but I wanted to be in the center of, of the HR office so that I could get to know HR folks a little bit better and kind of keep my pulse on what was happening within the department. And so I, I sort of gave up some privacy, um, but I feel like that was mostly to, to build relationships and, and stay up to date in a way that I, I felt like was, was needed in my position. Um, I'm also, you know, I, I often work work with a lot of departments across campus and um, pilot a lot of things with with managers and get a lot of input from campus before we roll things out. So that's another way that I've I've tried to maintain those relationships because I I think certainly over the last 15 years those have been pretty key in in my journey at PSU. Um, so I think I think I've covered all of my all of my points that I wrote down. So uh, again, I think there have been great results for me at PSU, and I also feel like it's been a win-win because I've been able to contribute at PSU in a in a way that's pretty meaningful. So um, I will pass it over to Mom now for for her story. Thank you so much. Um, I loved hearing your story again. That was great. Um, and yes, thank you again to Alex and OWG for for putting this on. It's um, really fun to, to be part of something maybe in your own space or mind and then realize that there's actually connections to other people who are doing something similar and to feel like you're part of something bigger. And that's one of the things I really appreciate about an opportunity in a community like this. Um, and 
I wasn't going to start with this, but uh, it kind of occurred to me as Sarah was talking about sort of where where this idea started and kind of the from within you're driven to to do something or change something. And uh, yesterday at yoga, um, the instructor was talking about how. Uh, there's two philosophies when you think about transformation. You either are already something that you are, are transforming or re-becoming, or you're not something, you lack something, and you transform into it because of these forces from the outside. And, and whether you think of it from the one perspective or the other, this idea of transforming, I think is really relevant when it comes to job crafting, because either, for me personally, it was I felt um, like I was in a a stage in my career four or five years ago where um, there was a misalignment between who I felt I really was and the work that I was doing. And I think sometimes people feel dissatisfaction because they think they can be more or do more and whether that's internal or external, there's, there's this drive or this feeling that there's, there's a misalignment. So um, I guess I kind of went to yoga for work um, and thinking about where I was, I had gone to graduate school and was um, really coming out of it with the goal of making a bigger difference in education. I, especially in the areas of, of equity and success for students, it was something that motivated me and that I had had some opportunities to do some work in. So I knew what that felt like and I liked it. Um, and I hoped that my training would prepare me for something super exciting and rewarding and contributing to, to the big picture. Working at a university was, um, was a really great step in that direction. Um, but I found myself uh, kind of pushing papers and collecting assessment reports and trying to like pull teeth from faculty members to get them to like turn in things that they didn't want to do. Um, and that felt very different than the work I felt called or drawn or even trained to do. Um, and I was pretty bummed, I was uninspired and I was bored. Um, and so I was at the point where I was like, oh, maybe I'll look for another job. And then my partner started uh, graduate school at the university and for a PhD. So I was like, oh, so I have five years and I should probably stick around here. Um, so that's when this idea of, well, what can I do with what I have now um, kind of came, came up. And um, the, the place where that took me um, to is getting clarity on what I wanted um, and what I had to offer, and also what the opportunities to, to move out of the, the space I was in. And it didn't necessarily mean uh, moving out of that office, it might be, but um, as Alex was, was sharing in the introduction, you know, you can, you can change the specific things you do or how you do them or how you think of them. Uh, so some of the things I did um, to help with that is, um, well, one of my uh, top five uh, strengths quest strengths is learner um, and my other one is strategic um, and so I laid out all of these different places where I could start consuming new information and ideas about things I could try um, and practice and started doing a lot of what I would call games within a game so I'd listen to a podcast about something or a series of podcasts about a topic that I felt I wanted to learn more about or have more skills in and then I'd find ways in my current job to practice those so one one that really stands out to me is meetings. Um, I was terrified of running a meeting and I realized if I ever wanted to be in a position of any sort of leadership, the really great people I looked up to ran awesome meetings. And I was like, I hate running meetings. I hate being in them. They overwhelm me. I can't keep anything straight. And it just, so I've been working on meetings for a while and I love running meetings. It's great, but it takes a lot of practice, um, intentional practice work. It's, it's, yeah, just like, just like yoga. Um, and I also volunteered to take on projects or roles that would grow those skills. So just like Sarah was saying, like, say yes, and then figure it out. Um, there's a lot of people who don't have a lot of time. And if you can make some time in the job you have where you're kind of bored to do something that builds a skill or put something in your toolkit, which can then serve you later, that's a really great use of your time. Um, I did a, a formal leadership training through HR, uh, which was a six session full day um, each time series. And that actually ended up helping me with my perception changes because um, one of the things I actually really appreciate about HR is the alignment between um, not just what, the, what someone's position description says in terms of tasks, but how that connects back to the 
greater purpose or the, the fulfillment of the mission for the institution. And so learning to think like that and apply that when I was getting a task I didn't like um, was super helpful. Um, and then the other thing I did was totally get myself outside a comfort zone and do something like run for an office for OWHE um, and chair search committees or a task force or things that really made me practice the things I knew I wanted to work on. Um, relationship wise, there were a lot of coffee dates and a lot of walks. Um, I was pretty transparent about where I was. I mean, I wasn't complaining about, oh, I hate my job and this and that, but I was pretty transparent about um, wanting to reach for more, um, the things I was interested in, and asked pretty directly for help and wisdom from people who I identified as having a particular skill or having achieved something or having done something in a certain way that I really admired or wanted to, to learn more about. Um, something I remember one of the, the senior leaders at our institution had made this huge pivot um, from one area of work into a completely different discipline and moved up like two steps in that trajectory. And I was like, how did you do that? Um, and what she shared with me is that she spent a lot of time learning the language of whatever that other place she wanted to go to. So um, we all have um, dialects and languages in terms of the culture and, and how we speak about our work. And so she worked really hard to learn how that discipline or that sector spoke and talked about things and then how she could talk about what she's doing in that context. Sarah, I think you, you were describing doing something really similar with your strengths. Um, and then I also started relationship in terms of relationship, following up with these um, individuals or people who I really admired and giving them ideas or saying, hey, I read this article or I listened to this podcast. I thought it might be relevant to you or I heard about this thing you did. I think it's really great. Thank you so much for doing that for the university. Um, a lot of times I think people forget to thank and appreciate up um, or share up because once, once you're achieving higher levels of, of professional standing, you don't necessarily have time to read all the articles or, you know, check the blogs or listen to the podcasts. And it's really helpful when other people give you compliments and feedback and, and input. So I found that to be a really good relationship piece. Um, so the perception uh, really a really important piece was the alignment between my values and the values of the organization and getting clarity on that and realizing that regardless of what the specific job or task is, um, I, I can align it back to something meaningful and something with purpose. And, and, if, and if I'm not the right person to do it, my network might be a good place to search for someone who's appropriate. So there are times when you get asked to do things where maybe you're not the right person to do it, either because of skill or because of whatever, um, but there could be someone looking for that opportunity or who's a, a better fit. So thinking about what the, the, the alignment between you, your position, your work, the goals of the university and everybody's values together um, seems a little abstract, but it you practice it a couple times, it gets pretty clear. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I did. Um, and the outcomes of that were really a lot of opportunities and some that I had sought, uh, like being on OWHE. Um, I was on the board for three years. It was a great experience. Um, and I did a lot of things I had never thought I would do, um, especially without having sort of baby steps getting up to it. Um, and then I also got a lot of opportunities that people thought of or created for me. Um, and I think a lot of that was being a self advocate and transparent around my, my personal goals. Um, sometimes people might call that pushy. Sometimes people may call it whatever. I don't care anymore. I cared then. I don't care now. Um, people give you opportunities when they see that you're, you're reaching for it and that you're capable of it. Um, and they want you to succeed. There was um, this, this satisfaction of, crafting what I was known for um, and being able to have a little bit more input and influence into what people, when they thought of something, they thought of me or when they thought of me, they thought of that. Um, and I, I really, that was satisfying to me, is satisfying to me. You can think of my job now either as associate director of institutional analytics, which is like a bunch of boring number stuff and 
structured reports, or I prefer to think about it as someone who empowers the university to make decisions based on information that's accurate and going to help them help all of the students who are going to go change the world succeed. Like, that's what I do. Um, and, and so I think it's exciting to have um, gone through a lot of job shifts in the last five years and had uh, different opportunities to either kind of bail and go in this direction or continue to see where the current path I'm on um, has led. And there's also a lot of trust and independence that comes along with showing over and over again that, you know, you're going to take a risk and you're going to figure out how to do it. There's a little slight risk of burnout in this whole process. Um, so remember to take care of yourself. Uh, I mean, I listened to podcasts on my own time outside of work for a while, probably 16 hours of my day was just thinking about work um, and how to how to move this forward. So it, it, it it's a lot of work. Um, but what I would say in sort of a, a wrap up or reflecting back key pieces of information, there's a lot that's free on the internet right now that you can just go learn and get for, you know, whatever. So that's a, a great place to start. Um, reaching outside to that, that one layer outside of your comfort zone. Don't go, go into danger. Don't, you know, get yourself fired or anything like that. But, you know, go, go to that area of, of discomfort and be thinking about what you want your destination to be and, and make the kind of decisions and choices that, that move you closer to that. Um, you don't have to do it 100% of the time, but it's, it's a helpful process. So I think I'll end there. Hopefully I covered all the, all the points. So I'll turn it back over to Alex. Awesome. Sarah, Chrysanthemum, thank you so much. I know I heard your same similar stories at OWHE and I feel like I learned a lot more even just the second time or maybe I'm thinking about it in a different way. So thank you so much for sharing your stories. And so I want to introduce our, our third panelist who is with us in spirit today. She's feeling under the weather and wasn't able to join. So Sarah Kooten is the Director of Student Services at University of Oregon Portland and she played a major role along with Sarah and Chrysanthemum in you know, crafting this panel and uh, contributing content to this. And so uh, when she uh, contacted me this morning, she sent me a, a story that she wanted me to share as part of uh, our webinar about her attempts to job craft and particularly one specific instance where she was able to add something to her job that she felt like was really missing and out of alignment. So I'm going to go forward with with reading that from from Sarah. So Sarah says, another example of following my passions to find satisfaction in my work was getting involved in a campus wide equity and inclusion committee. As a mid level professional, I was in a setting where diversity and, and inclusion were not a focal point of my work as it had been in a previous role. I found that missing being involved in discussions about social justice. I also felt like more could be done within my unit to align ourselves with institutional equity initiatives. In my role, I was tasked with making recommendations to the Dean about student appointments to campus committees. So I was aware of the opportunities to get involved on my campus. When I saw that they were looking for a student representative for the Equity and Inclusion Committee, even though I was not a student, I asked my dean if I could serve. I was careful to make my case and demonstrate the value of having me on the committee and what that would bring to our unit. Fortunately, she agreed. By serving on the committee, I was able to fill a gap in my professional practice in an area that is deeply important to me personally. It also helped me feel like I was involved in university-wide efforts to bring about change. I also brought updates back to my unit and started to share best practices. Being on the committee helped bring about other launching points for projects that I could build into my role. For example, planning a career conference that explored equity in the workplace, serving as a job search advocate to reduce bias in campus hiring practices, and working with a small group to select, campus climate, select a campus climate survey. All of these activities filled an area where I was not feeling satisfied and made me feel more confident in my role and my place within the department. That's a great story from Sarah Kuhn that uh, she, she wanted me to share with us today. Another great point that uh, Sarah brought up during our panel at the OWHE conference was that in job crafting, sometimes you need to job craft for a variety of external reasons. She gave the example of 
folks that are the head of their household and or the breadwinner, so to speak, and need to keep their current employment for those reasons or to maintain insurance. Um, Prince Anthema mentioned having a partner that's in a graduate program, that might be a reason that someone needs to, to stay put. So there's a variety of reasons that you might perhaps feel that you need to stay in the same job or um, are required to, uh, but that you're still feeling unsatisfied. And so job crafting is a, a really interesting strategy to use in those circumstances to try and, and make, the, make the best of your current situation and still find new things that you can learn and be engaged and, and more satisfied in your work. So now that we've heard three stories and we're able to learn from these different perspectives, I wanna open it up for Q&A. And I know that's a little different than maybe we've done on other webinars. And so what I wanna direct you to is the chat feature that is in the bottom panel of, of Zoom here. There's a little uh, piece that says chat. And so I wanna invite you to ask a question of one of our uh, two panelists. I'm happy to answer questions as well. And I will uh, moderate those, pull them out and uh, read them to the group. And uh, so please go ahead and I'll give you a moment We'll hang out and you start adding a question, adding questions on there. Chrysanthemum and Sarah, you are welcome to add questions as well if you have anything uh, that you'd like to ask each other. I have a question for Sarah. As a person in HR that does a development, um, are there particular things that someone could be looking for that are offered at their institution? institution that they could leverage or find support for. Sometimes it's easier to look within your organization to find something to support rather than the, hey, I want to do this thing outside. Um, so what, what types of things could people be looking for? Yeah, good question. So uh, I don't know if this is true at all the other universities, but at PSU we have a lot of committees. We have a lot of work groups. Um, and while people sort of roll their eyes sometimes, uh, the idea of going onto a committee and you know, sometimes it can be time consuming, I think that that is one of the best ways to build relationships across campus and to learn about what's actually happening and get involved in the initiatives and really shape them the way that you think they, they should go. Um, you know, when you're on a committee or in a work group, it, you know, it shouldn't just be a, an hour out of your week if, you have to week if you're meeting every week. It's your opportunity to have some influence. Um, you know, I think I think that people underestimate their ability and and access to people in order to influence the way things go or you know the, the decisions that are made. So I I would recommend that. Um, again, at PSU we we don't have a ton of formal training and development um, at the university because uh, training is half of my job, as I mentioned, and I'm, I'm kind of the only person in HR dedicated to training. And so we, we certainly have some more formal training opportunities, but I think most, most development um, for adults learns on the job and by doing. And so if you can get involved in those, those work groups and, and projects, um, that would be my recommendation. And, and sometimes that's, you know, talking with your boss or talking with your colleagues and, and not saying, you know, I, I'm dis I'm I'm not excited about my job anymore, or I'm disengaged. But maybe something like I'm really interested in getting more involved in X, or you know, I know this is a priority for our department or at the university. I wonder how my job can contribute to that, and just start having some of those conversations. And and I think um, that's that's a good way to start start kind of planting those seeds. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing about that. It's really interesting. I know all of our campuses probably have some different resources uh, to check out as well in those spaces. So those questions are starting to come in. Awesome. Thank you for participating. So I have a question here for Sarah. Um, you talked about the differences of moving from more reactive work to proactive work. Can you speak more to how the reactive work gets done now? Who puts out the fires? Yes. So in, in that example, so in, in, hi, Becky, by the way. Hi. <laughs> um, so in, in that role, um, so they, there were, there are still two people who are dedicated to employee relations as well as a director in that position. So in, in that situation, there were still other people to take on that work. Um, so it wasn't, we didn't, we didn't really hire an extra person. Um, I think the way that I, 
sort of sold it is that some of that work should have gone away um, with the proactive information and training that we were providing. Um, in the interim, I, I, mean, I was sort of doing both. I was taking on the employee relations cases and working on the training, but um, it, it wasn't, I mean, part of it was that I had to do both for a while um, and show that the training was, was a way to sort of front load some of that casework, I guess. Um, so I don't, I don't know that that answers your questions exactly, but I, I think the other, I guess the other part of it was as much as we could, we were sort of trying to spread some of that, those fires, <laughs> this sounds terrible. We're trying to spread some of the fires across the rest of the department so that some of the other, some of the other folks in HR were able to handle some of those basic, basic questions that were often sent to, to employee relations. So I'm not sure if that exactly makes sense, but it was, it was sort of a combination, I guess, was, is the answer. Excellent. Thank you so much. Seeing a question here about did job crafting ever result in formal changes to your positions? How did you handle extra work and did you get compensated for that? Uh, I can jump in with that. So job craft crafting for me did result in some formalized changes to position. So um, maybe what, three plus positions ago, I was um, a strategic analyst was my title. And it was a title that um, that job itself had been crafted uh, for, for me, but there wasn't really a, a compensation change. It was more just role changes, but there was sort of comparable work being done. But then uh, over the course of, of the year, I created some, some systems and, and things that uh, allowed me to um, expand the role. And I talked with my supervisor at the time about expanding the team. So going from an office of one and not having any direct reports, um, I ended up actually going to an office of four, uh, two full-time faculty and then two student employees. And so um, within, within that year of transition, um, the, the supervisor I had at the time was actually really helpful at helping me navigate and negotiate the, the system and um, explaining that, you know, in order to um, be compensated differently then the classification of the job would have to be different. And so then we worked on finding classifications that aligned more with the direction it was going. Um, and then, so we worked, worked together through that and at, at Oregon State, um, one of the things that if you're going to have a, a jump in your compensation that is not an off cycle merit raise, um, which you can only do once anyway, which I learned, um, it has to be because you've been reclassified. And so there was a lot of conversation about and, and trying to get clarity with my supervisor about what the expectations of the role was um, and doing some research about what appropriate compensation for that was and what was I think beneficial for me at the time is I did feel very safe talking to my supervisor about compensation and about roles and about making sure that we were on the same page about what was going to be done and how it was going to be compensated. So I think in some cases I was pretty lucky in the, the situation, but yes, the job crafting ended up with a new position and a larger team and more compensation. Um, I guess I'll add to that. Mine, my situation was not like that. Um, uh, my my title changed and my position did change um, when, for the change within HR that I made. Uh, my compensation really stayed about the same, um, and that was mostly. I, I'm not in a classification system. Um, I'm unrepresented and and sort of uh, compensated based on. Um, I guess similar positions, and so there's not there wasn't really a classification or a job type to point to. So I think that was I would say that that's worked a, a little bit against me because there isn't much of a structure to to base my position on. Um, that's changed a little bit in the last year or so as our classification system has uh, a little bit more structure around it. Um, but initially, I would say the biggest change was really in title, and then my, my position description did change. So it was an official change, but it didn't necessarily come with a change in compensation. And I don't have a team, so I'm very envious. <laughs> Excellent. I really appreciate that both of you provided different perspectives on that, because, yeah, that's really a challenging area, and it's difficult to strike the balance of 
committing to more work that is interesting to you, but also recognizing that when you take on more responsibilities that it's, it's fair to be compensated at a level that reflects that. So speaking to taking on more uh, responsibilities, I love this question here of what red flags might someone keep an eye out when they're job crafting to avoid burning out or over committing themselves? I can go first again. <laughs> um, so that is a great question and definitely something learned. Um, and so awesome for asking that and thinking ahead. Um, and so one of the things I would say is continuing to ask, find, find a question or a mantra that you can ask yourself. It's very specific advice, but find something that you can continue to ask yourself to make sure that there is clear alignment and connection and purpose to what it is that you're doing or adding. Um, one thing someone mentioned to me that they used to kind of juggle is saying, am I the, the best person to do this? Am I the only person who can do this? And is there someone else who should get a chance? Um, and because you're also growing in terms of your, your network and, and your strengths by helping other people connect to things. So I think sometimes it's always, well, for me, it's always flattering to get asked to do something. Um, and I'm, I'm a person that will say, yeah, I can do that. Um, and so what I've started to have to do as you expand is think about, am I the right person to do this? Given what I know about my values, given what I know about the clarity of my role, given what I know about where I wanna end up. Um, and sometimes that's a hard thing to, to say no to because it's a good opportunity or it's a very flattering offer, but, but where's the alignment, where's the connection and are you clear on what's being asked of you and, and how much bandwidth you have to give to that? Or can you give something up to take that on if it's more important? So it is, it is a little bit of a, um, a reflection and uh, consideration at, at any point. And I would, I would echo that. I think similarly for me, I would say that I, I have had to pull back on some projects that I have said yes and, and very enthusiastically jumped in because I, I have the same tendency because I, you know, if I see something that's interesting and I want to take on and I think is important, I'll jump in and say yes. And then, as I mentioned before, figure out how to do it later. I, I think what has been has been difficult is when that something that I want to jump into has never been done before, which in my case is often the case uh, because I'm, I'm kind of charting new territory in, in some things. And so, you know, folks who I work with and my boss don't necessarily know what it will take to get that done or what kind of commitment is required from executives or, or other leaders and folks. And so I think if depending on the commitment or availability of other people, I've, I've had to pull back on some things, which is a little disheartening and, and um, you know, can be kind of disengaging when you're really about, you're really excited about something, but then realize it's just, it's not possible or it's not a priority right now, or it has to be uh, kind of pushed down the road or, or something like that. Um, I would also add, just looking at the, the question, um, sometimes when you're job crafting, it's, it's not to advance, um, you know, it's not necessarily a promotion. I, I think that's what I saw in my role is I really didn't get promoted. Um, I, I really just changed to a, to a very different job. Um, and so sometimes that's, sometimes that's not what you're exactly looking for. You know, sometimes I, you know, I have to talk to people and say, you know, I, I want to be in a director position. That's my goal. And I think that that's, it's really limiting when you're only looking for positions that, are, that have been classified as higher than you versus looking at the ones that maybe have the, the areas of interest that, that really spark your interest or um, are just something different that might re-engage you. So I, I think that's something to consider when you're, when you're looking about how to, how to craft your job. Awesome, thank you all. Oh, can I add one thing? Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, so the other thing I was going to add is, you know, a lot of a, the focus of what we're talking about in your a comment, Sarah, about, you know, maybe it's not a priority right now, or maybe the priorities have shifted. Um, we think about a lot of times with job crafting, what we're doing and, and the effort we're putting in, I find it very helpful to have partners to think through um, these things with. And I'm fortunate right now to have a supervisor who's really easy to talk to about, hey, this is my plate right now. I'm feeling a little bit burned out. Can we review this and talk about what really is priority and what can either shift 
or what can be put on pause. Um, and so if you don't have that relationship with your supervisor, perhaps that's something a trusted colleague or a peer um, can be a good sounding board for if you have to craft a little bit of how you would bring that to your supervisor. Um, but, but that's something else is don't underestimate the power of, of your, your network and your, the team that surrounds you and your colleagues. Awesome. Well, thank you. Well, our last question, we kind of have an answer to, but uh, if you noticed in, we came, this group came up with some great resource recommendations for continued reading and learning and to uh, some of these podcasts that uh, Chrysanthemum refers to, um, uh, they are listed up here in the top of the group chat. Uh, have those downloads for you. So if you want to get up and take a look at those. But we had the question from Laura of what is one must read off that, that long list of different resources? So I put my answer in the chat also. It's um, not really a read, but I personally got the most benefit from the How to Be Awesome at Your Job podcast. Um, they're about 30 minutes long. They're very well structured. Um, the website, you can go and search any topic related to work or even work-life balance. Um, and it searches all the transcripts and gives you a collection of all of the 30 minute episodes that have to do with it. And they're authors and experts and people who are very um, accomplished in all sorts of areas of, of professional development and success. So I. I really recommend that. Um, I think anything by Simon Sinek or Brene Brown is usually good to find a little bit of inspiration. Um, both of them have many, many articles, books, podcasts, short videos, um, and I, I think they're really good if you're if you're in a slump and just sort of need somebody to to boost you up a little bit. I think that's um, that would be my recommendation. Awesome. Thank you both so much for that. So definitely check out that recommendations list, your curated uh, playlist or reading list on there. I tried to make sure and include a lot of different modalities of short video, book, article, podcast. Um, so however you like to consume learning, there are some options there. And so I want to uh, jump over to the last segment of something that I want to give you to kind of take away uh, from this. So we're going to look at the uh, activity handout if you want to download that. It's off the group chat. And so I'll also, if you're not able to access that, get it shared here. And so I wanted to share something to help you start thinking about how you could apply this in your work. So this is an activity that we designed for the uh, uh, this presentation that was at the conference. But uh, everybody, can we see the activity on there? Okay, awesome. Uh, so this is something that I'm um, kind of a solo activity that I hope you can take the concepts that you learned today and uh, kind of walk through reflecting on your own job and your own strengths and uh, put to job crafting into practice. So the idea here being you'd write down four, four to six responsibilities, frequent tasks, things you do in your work, um, and then circle how you feel about them, neutral, positive, negative, and then how much time is spent on those, like just kind of overall looking, looking at uh, your position. Uh, is it something you do a lot sometimes or, or not very often? So then step back from there here in step two and think about what are your strengths? What are you great at? What, is, what motivates you? Uh, why, do you, why do you do what you do? Why do you get up? Why do you come to work? Uh, why did you take this job or come into this field in the first place? How has that changed over time? And then what are your passions? What are things that you love to do or that are important to you? And then you'll step back one step further and look at kind of the intersections between those. What do you notice uh, in the connections between the tasks that are part of your job, the things you love and the things you hate, and how do those align with your strengths, motives, and passions? And then based on that analysis, start thinking about what are some areas that you might job craft in? Uh, where might you start? Where's, what's one thing that you could do initially to be able to, to think through this, to uh, put one job crafting principle into practice? Sometimes perceptions are both the easiest and the hardest one to start with because it is only just you and your mind, um, but I do know it is sometimes hard to change your thinking about a topic. So that might be either an easier or a harder one for you to start with. You can also look at tasks and relationships in that sense as well. So a couple of things I'm still thinking about through discussion. At this point, when we start applying it, it's uh, you hear these stories and uh, if you're like me, you're really inspired uh, by the, the three women we've been able to feature on the 
webinar today. And it's easy to start thinking about all the things, all the ways that you, that, uh, that you might not be able to do something similar, that this might not work for you. So for instance, uh, you know, you might be thinking, my boss would never be okay with this. They want me, they hired me to do this one exact job. Uh, it's not gonna be possible to make changes. And you know, that may very well be true. And if you find it is, uh, doing perceptions crafting can be a really specific one. One of the stories I read about in the research was about janitors and that they were hired to do a very specific job of cleaning a hospital but the ones who enjoyed their job the most were ones who framed it in a way of how they were helping uh, the healthcare, like take care of patients by providing like a clean and safe environment for those patients to receive care in. And that they were doing like little things to, to make the experience better for patients through their cleaning, which is super interesting. They didn't change anything about their job but they're able to change those perceptions. Also, it's uh, summer, it's kind of time for a lot of annual reviews or maybe setting goals for the year. That is a great time to bring up some job crafting style goals maybe with your uh, boss or supervisor. Some other barriers might be you're too busy. And I definitely feel that one. And you think about this and how could you do something that is currently on your plate in a different way? that might help you job craft rather than adding uh, specific responsibilities. That's one way. If you're not able to take on a new committee or, or do a new project, you can think about this. And then lastly, if you're feeling unsure about what are my strengths and passions uh, and what areas should I job craft in? What should I job craft towards? I would start by thinking, uh, trying to keep, uh, just by noticing, maybe keeping like a little journal or like a note some notes at your desk of just notice when do you feel energized what, what were you just doing when do you feel low and kind of about your job what, what were you just doing then and after a couple weeks of taking those notes you will definitely start to see a pattern of when you're most energized and when you're and when you're not and that can maybe lead you to some insights about what your strengths are and what your motivations and uh, things in your role and so uh, I wanted to leave you with those thoughts uh, of how to overcome some of those common barriers and uh, definitely check out the uh, activity handout here and spend some time making notes on that. And then also um, the resources. So those are uh, two really awesome things that we wanted to leave you with uh, to take this work from here. So I wanted to thank Chrysanthemum and thank uh, Sarah for joining us and thank Sarah also, uh, Sarah Kooten for contributing content and a story to this. And um, thank you, Shannon and OWHE for hosting us. It's been a pleasure to spend time with you today and have a great afternoon. Thanks, Alex. Uh, and I'll be sending out the um, worksheet as well after this in case you had trouble getting a hold of it. All right. See you next time. Great. Thanks all.